would light one burner, and you, you had a heat up sequence that you went through uh, to properly heat up all the refractory in the boiler so you wouldn't crack it and it would fall out. Uh, and then when you were getting underway, you would put more burners in for more power. And you also had sprayer plates, some small and some very large, where you could also use those sprayer plates to increase the amount of heat you put into the boiler. That furnace over there is called the superheated furnace, where, where you remove the steam from the water and you increase it in temperature. Saturated steam is about 430 degrees, and uh, superheated steam, you could go to 800 degrees with it. With the 800 degree superheated steam, that's what you drove your main engine with. Saturated steam is what you run your auxiliary with. So then, how do you know, like you were saying that the, the, you want the smoke to be more clear looking than white or black? You always wanted a clear stack, and, and this handle right here controls three forced wrap blowers in the back of the boiler. Uh, so the more you open that valve, the more air went into the furnace. And this is where you would watch. This would be your saturated furnace here. You would watch in here until you get a clear stack. If you had to change speeds and you put another burner in, you'd have to give it more air and then you'd have to watch your stack to make sure you maintained a clear stack. So that you could visually see after yeah. those. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. They've been blocked off because we're on an after military base now, so we can no longer see them. You gotta remember nothing was automatic on these on these ships. Nothing. Not at all. It was all manually operated. The ships today are all automated. So how many people would it take to process? Seven people per quarter. And you normally only steam one boiler per space. If you went into, uh, oftentimes if they were going to shoot the guns, they would make you light off all, both boilers. And then you'd do like three knots. I, mean, I guess it was just something they liked to do. But it was very hard to steam at three knots. I can imagine. <laughs> so what kind of water is used for to create the steam? Uh, it's evaporated water? Yeah, it, keep in mind that the water used for these is so purified that if you were to drink it, it would make you sick. Um, the reason is, is you're going through a bunch of little pipes. You don't, you can't go in there and clean them all the time. That's just annoying. Right, that's right. So you want it to be so purified that it's not going to leave any residue <laughs> or very little, if at all. So where do you get the purified water? <coughs> They're going to take. So okay. the, the, the water is sucked out of the ocean yeah. in okay. the evaporators and heat is used to evaporate the salt. Do you get your seawater? All right, so you're, you're distilling it in essence. You're distilling it and you're getting it. Okay. Getting it. Uh, so you're going to get a little bit a better idea. We were required to clean the boiler like over 600 hours. We'd have to take it completely apart, uh, acid clean it, and then put it back together and go for another 600 hours. Wow. So on, on average, how often was that? Uh, not very often, because they they were pretty good about shifting the boilers around to so keep you from getting up to that 600 too long. hour level. You, know, you rarely did it underway. If you had to do it underway, it was really a hot, nasty, a hot, nasty job. Yeah, and I said I just wanted to show you this kind of gives you a better idea of the mm -hmm. water steam cycle. You take it from the ocean, go to your evaps. This is going to feed it through your boilers. Your uh, kind of what your first go around and you turn it into your superheated steam going through your uh, generators, also your turbines, and so forth, and then it just kind of circles about. So what's happening with what is not pure? Um, I mean, what's it's getting either filtered out? Does it drop back into the water? Uh, well, no, because you still need some fresh water on board. So okay. you're going to, from this derivative, derivative you're going to feed your boilers, and then you're also going to have enough uh, fresh water for showers, cooking, yeah. that kind of the stuff. The main focus of your evaporators were to provide water for the boilers. Anything left would go for crew consumption. And keep in mind that because it is such a big ship and those were actually really good evaps, they never had issues with uh, fresh water, with having enough fresh water for the regular daily stuff. Uh, now, like it was mentioned earlier, it's very hot in here. If you notice it, it's a little on the warmer side. It wasn't I mean, it's only There's 10 no o'clock without the boiler, right? <laughs> it's only 10 o'clock. Um, this, this space in here, uh, 
difference uh, in temperatures from 40s to 80s, from in the 40s, about 120 to about 150 degrees. Eighties time frame, I've been told 90 to about 120, 130 degrees. The drop isn't that they get air conditioning because we don't have it. It's those vents that uh, were mentioned are there. See right here? It's a suction system. So you're pulling air from deck levels above down here. When the guys above get AC, your air you're pulling down is immediately cooler and it drops the temperature. And another big factor in terms of the temperature in here is the water temperature. The cooler it is, the cooler you're going to be in here. Um, it is an okay day today, but uh, in hot summer days here on Oahu, it is disgusting in here. It is gross. Uh, you, you, you're in here for two minutes and you're sweating. Uh, because the water is so hot. So that has a big to do with the temperatures in here as well. If you're in somewhere like Alaska where the water's going to be nearly freezing, your space is going to be cooler and it's going to be more bearable per se. So how far below the water line are we? Uh, the water line is one level above us. I'll show you when we're up there. So these are the fans you were talking about? When, uh, the blowers. We, kept, we pulled into Hawaii one time here and we were going to do a tiger cruise back home where you bring on your dad and your kids and whatnot. Huh. Uh, so we loaded all these people on board. We got underway, we got out, I don't know how many miles, and, and it, the weather got extremely rough. And the intakes, for these vent, the, the intakes for these vents are up on the O3 level, pretty high. But the ship was going so far under the water that the water was flooding into the intakes. Wow. So when you were standing down there trying to be cool, this whole thing would run solid with salt water. Wow. You could hear it load up. You could hear it load the fan up. And if you were really smart, you got away from it. <laughs> but the first couple huh. of times, nobody knew what was going on. And it was just huh. totally nasty. Oh, wow. And you had all the dads and kids that were just laying sick everywhere. Because hmm. this the ship would actually dive into the water up to like the 04 level. That's no fun. Uh, now, also another pretty big concern down here would be steam leaks, and particularly your high pressure leaks. Because at that point, nothing you can do, that's when you run to your escape trunk and get out of here. Uh, keep in mind that you're dealing with uh, 600 pounds of pressure, 800 degrees. Uh, that is a lot of heat. Your body is not going to be able to handle that, so you're going to run to that escape trunk and get out of here. Anything else to add in here, sir? Usually you get fried from your lungs. Your lungs would just, uh, because of this, the heat and the steam, would just fry your lungs. Not necessarily to burn your body, but just fry your lungs. Wow. Oh. So, we came down a flight of steps mm -hmm. right from Broadway, mm -hmm. and something in on Broadway would control down here, right? Just no? for emergency. Like for an emergency now? Like if you just steam that? When you thing? evacuated your space, you went up into Broadway and that's where you shut your boiler down. There was enough, like your fuel oil fuel trips, your main steam stop, closing valves, your eductor system to suck the fuel out. Uh, but that was really the only mm -hmm. thing that you did up on Broadway. Yeah, and that was just in case of an emergency. If you had it your way, you would shut things down here. Um, if you were right, if okay. you were capable of it, you would shut it down here because it's a, it's a better response than up on Broadway. That's just a backup. A, a just you know, if this doesn't work, we can do this to help it. So on that video, mm -hmm. he was saying that it could. Did I understand? He said it could take like three hours to get a ship underway. Yeah. Okay. So when Pearl Harbor was attacked, there was one ship that was able to get underway. Mm -hmm. Was that the Nevada, maybe? Mm -hmm. How did it get underway that quickly? It hurt. She hadn't shut down her uh, oh. fireworks. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if she had just gotten to port or just hadn't done it yet or was kind of gearing up to start heading out. Okay. But she hadn't shut down her, her so that's <laughs> fireworks okay. yet. That's why she had enough steam to get her going. And obviously didn't get her going very fast mm -hmm. um, considering she kind of got stuck in. Right. I think that captain was the only captain to receive an award for running his ship aground. Um, because it was a better choice at that point in time. Usually when we would get underway, we would be, the BTs and the engine would be required to be out here at midnight mm. to light off and warm up all the equipment. The rest of the crew would come aboard at 7 o'clock and you'd get underway at like 8 o'clock. Okay. 
and another little tidbit of information is when we went to recommission this and the shipyard started turning the spaces over to the sailors. Four engine room, four fire room were the first spaces to be turned over. So everybody in engineering came down to four fire room, four engine room and cleaned their space for them. When this space was cleaned and they turned over number three fire room, the people that were going to man four fire room got left here and the crew moved forward, mm -hmm. cleaned number three, and as that, that got cleaned and number two got turned over, those people stayed there and the others moved to number two. So by the time they got to number one, the only people cleaning number one was, the people, was the people that were uh, manning wow. that. So there was always a lot of, I won't call it hatred, but there was always just a lot of uh, unhappiness about the way they did that. Hmm. I don't see that. That's frustrating. Were you were you on as part of the recommissioning? Was that kind of cool? I mean, it just seems like that would be neat if you were in the military to be able to have been a part of a recommissioning. I actually stood watch during the commissioning ceremony. I was I was standing watch on that boiler over there because we were actually lit off when they commissioned oh. the ship. Wow. I've also. Um, from modern sailors, I've been told there's two types of sailors around. Those who have served on battleships and those who wish they had. So, I, I mean, I think you had a pretty big honor there, so not only were you recommissioning her, but you got to serve on board the last one, so. These were very tough ships. Very tough. <laughs> you worked. Okay. Usually you stood four and eight. You, you stood four hours of watch, and you had eight hours off, but the eight hours was considered to be a work day. So you did four and eight with an eight-hour workday. So you got maybe three, four hours of sleep a night. And then if you had something break down, you got no sleep. And things were constantly breaking down. She's an old, old ship, I can imagine. All right. So let's head to our engine room now. <laughs>